President, fellows, friends, there's quite a long lecture to be given on the subject of the Conservation Management Plan, but as this is my second outing on the topic before a group of fellows this week, I realise I'm already pushing my luck. In 1962, the Society of Antiquaries was presented with Kelmscott Manor by Oxford University. It had been left to Oxford for permanent preservation by Morris's younger daughter, May, in 1939. Eventually, the university found they could not carry on with Kelmscott. It was difficult to get tenants, and the property was expensive to maintain. As the residuary legatee of May Morris's will, the society was served with a summons and became the new legal owner. It was also a very nice lunch at New College, apparently. <laughs> By 1962, the garden had become completely overgrown, and the house, now in an advanced state of decay, was surrounded by nettles as you see. The council's first reaction was to instruct the sale of Kelmscott, but the secretary, Dick Dufty, and the president, Joan Evans, had other ideas. Joan Evans, Evans acquainted her niece, Susan Minnett, with the problem, and very soon the society received shares worth £350,000. This was, in real terms, one of the largest single gifts in the society's history. By 1968, 40,000 of this had completely restored the house. The whole project had been steered by Dick Duffy and the work of restoration carried out by Sir Donald Insel and our late fellow Peter Locke. This was a heroic epoch in the history of the society. Today, even with a very limited opening program, Kelmscott has been capable of attracting 18,000 visitors a year. This is the main place where the Society of Antiquaries meets the general public, and this significant visitation is central to the accredited museum status which the Society's important collections enjoy. It's clear, moreover, from the visitor's book at Kelmscott that the public is more than delighted with this aspect of the Society's work. As the expert is not fully benefited from this goodwill, but the fact is that we offer the public something very distinctive at Kelmscott. The experience of visiting the home of perhaps our most famous former fellow, whose whole life and work is a demonstration of how the study of the past can be used to shape both the present and the future. More than this, we allow them to see the building which more than any other shapes Morris's view of how people should live. It's also the only significant one of Morris's former homes in which the domestic arrangements and contents are more or less intact. Now today the council very understandably becomes concerned when large repairs bills at Kelmscott present themselves, especially when it has other pressing commitments. In fact, it's perfectly possible to ensure that the state does not overburden society's resources, but only if we have a program for repair and fundraising in which we establish a long-term relationship of confidence with potential funding bodies and individuals, because a society cannot really do this job in perpetuity on its own. Central to such a program and to the effective care of Kelmscott is a document in which the society's conservation program is set out in detail and on the basis of a coherent rationale. Conservation plans were invented in Australia in the 1990s by James Semple Kerr for the planned conservation of the large Victorian prisons that played such a significant role in the early colonial history of the continent. Perhaps an, an unlikely start. But here, a very attractive but historically incredibly important Fremantle prison. These plans are now de rigueur in the UK for all owners seeking external funding or contemplating development. Organisations like the Heritage Lottery Fund need to be certain that those bodies it assists are competent, stable, and capable of making plans based on sound curatorial principles, careful thought, and deep knowledge. Conservation management plans divide into four sections. The first is understanding, the second is significance, the third deals with issues, and the fourth sets out policy. This is not an elegant literary form, but it is logical and it aids clear thinking. I've drafted a new conservation management plan on these lines with our fellow Merlin Watson. 
He's the former Historic Properties Director of the National Trust, and we worked together for several years on the care and presentation of some of the trust houses, great and small. Our document is, moreover, built on very firm foundations because it incorporates an earlier conservation plan by our fellow Nicholas Cooper. This has been hugely helpful, and a lot of his excellent work survives in the document, and I should say verbatim in many cases. Nicholas Cooper has known Kelmscott for a very long time. In fact, he went there in 1958 when it was owned by Oxford University, and he met the then tenant, Dr. Wren, Dr. D.C. Wren. And this incident he told me about uh, last night because it sheds considerable light on those green canvas strips on the bed. The bed was indeed roped in those days from the brass eyelet holes in the green canvas strips. And every night before they went to bed, the wrens would pour water on the ropes to tighten them up and then put the mattress back on and get into bed and it would descend gradually overnight. So presumably they rolled into the middle. But that's uh, something that Nicholas told me uh, just the other night. I'm sure he won't mind my uh, relaying it to you. It's so relevant for this evening's discussion. Well, the first draft of our plan has received the approval of the Kelmscott Committee and it went to the Council today. In the uh, new year, after necessary revisions and corrections, it will be issued for wider consultation. And consultation is a very important part of a conservation plan because it derives its authority from consensual support. I think uh, what we'll do at this stage is jump right into the subject and see how the kind of thinking that the conservation plan embodies uh, is directly applied. The uh, future treatment uh, of the manor's uh, fine staircase is not a pressing matter in terms of the society's priorities right now, but it needs to be given more thought, or it needs to be thought about in the way that virtually everything else at Kelm Scott does. It comes at the back of the plan in the gazetteer, where the property is treated room by room and building by building. Here the four headings of understanding significance issues and policy follow each entry. In the case of the stairs, under understanding tells us that this is the original staircase of the first ver version of the Turner family house and built in about 1600. It would also establish from a country life photograph of the 1920s that Morris and Rossetti seem to have painted it a dark colour, probably green, like the other ground floor woodwork, and that it was probably Oxford University or its tenant that stripped the stairs back to the bare wood, as many people did in country houses during the interwar period. There's the country life photograph. In the significance section, we established in a rather cat-on-the-map way that the primary importance of the staircase is as an element of the Jacobean house. So we then move on to the issue, which is the wood has been stripped back. Not just the paint which Morris may have put on it, but also all the preceding layers, because perhaps this was always uh, a painted staircase. And furthermore, we can't be certain of the Morris colour, because the earliest photography is black and white. The policy is, therefore, that we should undertake some historic paint research to find out more about the colour and consider putting back the scheme that Morris would have known. This policy recommendation depends on earlier general statements on significance that establish, notwithstanding its relatively recent date, the occupation of Kelmscott by the Morris family is historically of very great importance. In fact, it's the reason why we look after the house. And if the recommendation on paint research looks rather a lost cause, we could look underneath the handrail and see many layers of historic paint that were missed. Some greeny brown, some red, and some, uh, sorry, some brownish, some red, and, and, and strange spots of green which are the top layer, which seems to have been stripped off first. Now, some people would be uh, dismayed at covering up the wood of this staircase because they've got used to its natural beauty. That's very understandable. And when the plan goes out to consultation with stakeholders, including the volunteers, that point will no doubt be put quite forcibly. But our job is to make sure that the option of restoring lost features of the Morris interiors is properly considered. The house is actually full of very interesting dilemmas of this kind, and unless they are recognized explicitly as a danger of cumulative, discrete, and expedient decisions, gradually eroding its historic character. Historic buildings are in most cases records of change. 
in buildings that have been in private ownership and then passed into the hands of organizations, there's an important qualitative difference between the changes made by private owners and those undertaken by their institutional custodians. The changes put in hand by the family are of primary importance, while those of the institutions are secondary. Changes made by institutional owners might in themselves be agreeable and useful, but they should not in many cases be allowed to stand in the way of what we know to be authentic. So I'm going to look at some aspects of the society's restoration and presentation of Kelmscott, and the first thing I should do is pay tribute to its excellence. The fact that the public derive so much pleasure from the manor's rooms is a real tribute to the stylish and adroit restoration of the 1960s and subsequent periods. But I do think the time has come to think again about some of the decisions that were made all those years ago, especially in the light of all the advances that have been made in the presentation of historic houses in the last two or three decades. Here are two cases in point. First of all, the tapestry room. This was, um, first of all, the studio of Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who took out a lease of Kelmscott uh, with Morris. He wasn't there that long, but it's one of the rooms added to the manor in the handsome north wing built in the last quarter of the 17th century. In it, there are hanging beautiful 17th century tapestries telling the story of Samson. These are long considered to be an ancient feature of the decoration of this room, but I begin to think they may possibly have been introduced in the 19th century. I may be wrong about that, but uh, only time will tell. Given the importance of Rossetti as an artist, the continuing public interest in his relationship with Jane Morris, and the lack of surviving studios of founder members of the Free Raphaelite Brotherhood, this is a very important room. It also later on, of course, became a favorite sitting room of the Morris family when Rossetti had gone. It was, however, a substantially different room in Morris and Rossetti's time. Before the society's restoration, the bay on the east side was a closet separated by a partition and concealed by tapestries which also covered the entrance to the room from William Morris's bedroom. So um, this whole bay here was opened up by the society. So you've got to imagine the tapestries and a wall continuing uh, across there. And uh, we do have a view of the room at one corner of it uh, by the photographer Frederick Evans, taken in 1896 or thereabouts, and it shows you the original arrangement. You can see the door, which in the previous slide was uh, set in a wallpaper of surround put in by the Society of Antiquaries, okay, that, there it is, um, was actually covered in tapestry um, in Morris's time. And the tapestry extended across uh, the back to was it the back to the room as it was called, but I shall, I shall come to that. <coughs> they incorporated a large L-shaped cut to allow the door uh, to open. The closet beyond this, as I've intimated, was known as the bachelor, bachelor's room, and its large mullioned window, which I showed you in the first slide, six lights, I think, um, was, with the exception of the two central lights, blocked up, presumably, for more warmth. It would have been a jolly cold room had they not done that. It was, according to a memorandum by May Morris, hung with the serge hangings embroidered in the daisy pattern. These are now downstairs in the garden hall. There they are. They were worked by Jane Morris for Red House in the early 1860s, and they were also used for Morris & Co's stand at the 1862 exhibition. Now, it would be quite possible to recreate the original arrangement of the tapestry room. May's memorandum and the 1939 inventory would also allow the recreation of the bachelor's room with indigenous furnishings, by and large. If necessary, the window lights could be blocked on the inside without affecting the manor's external appearance. And this would create the um, uh, room where Charles uh, Gere recalled staying uh, when he came to do drawings uh, at Kelmscott. And it was no doubt stayed in by all of uh, Morris's guests, and may even at one stage have been occupied, for all I know, by Dante Gabriel Rossetti himself. If we did this, it would create some very interesting complications. If we just hop back a couple of slides, you'll see that the tapestry that goes round the corner into the bay has a very 
large uh, figure of Samson surrounded by slain Philistines lying on their sides. Um, in Morris's time, this was actually hung on its side um, and doubled over in a corridor downstairs. And so, in fact, it was folded in half and hung on its side. Which is a, I suppose it provided the right kind of coloured background for things, but so it didn't make a great deal of sense. It did, however, leave the Philistines standing up, which was one uh, possible uh, advantage. But um, it, it's very interesting, that, and I suspect that the society's whole motive for uh, opening this bay up uh, was perhaps uh, to do greater justice to the tapestries, the 17th century tapestries, and to accommodate them as much as possible uh, altogether. They didn't even quite achieve that. So if we were to reinstate the original tapestry hang, this would involve reopening of cuts that allowed the entrance door and other removals, and there would be knock-on effects, including a question about the destination uh, of the tapestry from the passage. The sort of thing gives tapestry conservators nightmares. But as the tapestries themselves are in need of major repairs, this is a good point to consider all these issues. And I think it's the job of the conservation plan uh, to raise them. Jane Morris's bedroom. Less controversial, but in some ways more intricate, is the problem of Jane Morris's bedroom. This is something of a themed interior today, based on the portrait of Jane, which before May's death in 1939, hung in the panelled room downstairs. The painting is a copy of Rossetti's Water Willow by Charles Fairfax Murray. There she is. Today, both the bed and the walls are hung with a modern version of the pattern known as Willow Bow, a Morris design inspired by the willow-fringed banks of the Thames at Kelmscott. The original arrangement and decoration of the room is, however, shown in a photograph by Frederick Evans of 1896-7. In the Evans print, I can see a number of interesting things. First of all, that the walls were then hung with Morris's pomegranate paper. That pattern, I think, the one against the uh, stony background. And that the bed was hung with a Morris pattern of 1868. It's called small stem. This is very interesting. This was a very early Morris, Marshall and Faulkner and Co. product and was quite unlike the firm's later work. It was one of a group of textiles printed from existing 1830s blocks in the Lancashire Cotton Mill of Thomas Clarkson in 1868. So not a Morris original at all. May notes in her memorandum that this bed was that of Morris Mare rather than Jane, and it was the, that it was the bed in which William Morris was born. We do not know when the bed was put up in Jane's room, but it's certainly before 1939. Morris's long-lived mother died at the age of about 90 in 1894, just two years before her famous son. So this is possibly the date when the bed came to Kelmscott, along with presumably some other things, from her house in Hertfordshire. Possibility. The original hangings of the bed reflected, perhaps, the taste of the previous generation, someone born in the first decade of the 19th century. As May makes clear in the memorandum, the chief interest of the bed is at the place of Morris and Burke. Well, one can understand very much the motives behind the current decoration, because they provide visitors with an instructive story about Jane Morris, Rossetti, and the willows which were originated into the fabric from Kelmscott. But the room's original decoration tells a more complex and subtle story, and what is more, this is the truth, or part of it. If we look more closely at the photograph, we can see that the room is lit strongly from a single source to the right. There you are. <coughs> Whereas today, there are windows in two walls. In fact, the bed today is turned through 90 degrees. In Jane's time, its foot faced the chimney piece. Evans's photograph of the outside of the house shows indeed that the window in the wall behind the bedhead at this time 
was blank. And there you can see that piece of blank walling just there. No window. Well, it would be possible to vi visit each of the manor's rooms in turn and discover other deviations from the house of the Morris family. There is indeed a very useful chapter on this whole subject by Jonathan Howard in the Society's publication, William Morris's Kelmscott, and it's entitled, Kelmscott as William Morris Never Knew It. It's clearly essential that the Society comes to terms with all these contradictions and plots a reasoned course for the future, future because we are the long term, perhaps the perpetual owners of this wonderful place. Well, the job of the conservation plan is not to take decisions on these matters, but to raise the questions and to guide consideration of them. The step that follows publication of the plan is the setting up of a small working group to develop the strategy in which proposals for the rumours can be firmed up, taking into account all the practical considerations that impact upon them, including, no doubt, public opinion. One thing that the plan makes clear is that we can never really get back to the house as it was in the time of Morris himself. And that's because following his death in 1896, the contents of the London house, that's Kelmscott House in Hammersmith, were moved into Kelmscott. There are some of the things that you can see at Kelmscott in uh, the Hammersmith house in a drawing by E. H. New. These contents greatly enriched the collection at Kelmscott, which up to that point had been, I think, pretty sparse. In came a range of items from Morris's earliest days, including many pieces from Red House, like that great settle uh, with the cove top, which you can see on the left of that slide. Pieces from Red House which evoked <coughs> the romantic Gothic revivalism to which the more vernacular plainness of Kelmscott was the powerful antidote that formed Morris's highly influential later thinking on domestic design. The best that we can do is perhaps to get closer to the time of May Morris and her arrangement of Kelmscott, where this is possible. And it won't be possible or even perhaps desirable everywhere and in every detail. So I suppose the question arises, is there anywhere in Kelmscott where the building itself, internally that is, speaks most eloquently of the plain interior that Morris first loved? loved? Well, the description of Kelmscott in Morris's visionary socialist novel, News from Nowhere, provides a very strong hint. You're all familiar, I'm sure, with the frontispiece from this uh, beautiful book. That's the copy in the Morris Gallery. So I quote, we went in and found no soul in any room as we wandered from room to room, from the rose-covered porch to the strange and quaint garrets amongst the great timbers of the roof, where of old time the tillers and herdsmen of the manor slept, but which a night seen now by the small size of the beds and the litter of useless and disregarded matters, bunches of dying flowers, feathers of birds, shells of starlings' eggs, Caddis worms in mugs and the like seemed to be inhabited by children. Everywhere there was but little furniture, and that only the most necessary and of the simplest forms. The extravagant love of ornament which I had noted in these people elsewhere seemed here to have given place to a feeling that the house itself and its associations was the ornament of the country life amidst which it had been left, stranded from old times, and that to re-ornament it would but take away its use as a piece of natural beauty. Well, the only place in Kelmscott where I think we can hope to recapture the spiritual simplicity to which Morris's followers were to cleanse European design of 19th century clutter is in the attics. First slide of the attics, um, showing their mighty roof timbers, and here is another. We're proposing that most contents should be removed from the attics. Here people can get remarkable views from the windows without worrying about light streaming in on ancient textiles. And here the noble structure of the roof furnishes the space in the way 
that more it is right. There should be beds and some furniture in the small garret, uh, but that's all. I now show you a wonderful photograph which is very famous um, by Frederick Evans uh, of the attics in the late 18 or the mid 1890s. And I want you to contrast it uh, with the way in which they are shown today. There. Of course, you can see the props which give away uh, the poor condition of the main roof timbers and which add so much to the beauty of this space. The fact that the V-shaped roof valley uh, 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 in between the garrets is completely plastered up in snowy white, everything covered in a thick layer of lime wash, uh, and the place really a sensational uh, monu mo monochrome interior of great uh, spiritual power and beauty. Whether we can entirely get back to that, I don't know, but I think there are ways. Thicker lime wash, uh, less objects, as, as I said earlier, and possibly do something with the banisters of our staircase, which actually essentially gets people up into the attics. Uh, I don't know, but these are practical issues, uh, and they need to be uh, confronted. The objects uh, that the attics are full of um, can find another place uh, at Kelmscott. Since the custodians no longer live in the property, we have three vacant rooms on the first floor. I think actually four. Um, which, as they uh, were intended in 1960s, as custodians' accommodation retained scarcely any of their original features. These can accommodate material from the attics and should allow sufficient flexibility for changing exhibitions and displays. And what you can see on the slide at the moment uh, are the Byrne Jones drawings. Actually, the light is a lot gloomier in there. I've just exposed the um, shot rather uh, longer, but it needs to be uh, for such pressure, pe precious paper items. Well, there are many Im other important challenges of uh, Kelmscott um, in the landscape, perhaps, which has changed dramatically, I can remember my lifetime, uh, by Dutch elm disease in the 1960s. And its various meadows and fields have been affected by modern agricultural methods, not always to the good. Uh, and it's, I think it's quite interesting, actually, to to see how landscape is capable of change and how little one can sometimes do about it. This is the uh, riverbank today, um, in which you can see the trees are all of uh, a modest height. And before the 1960s, uh, Oxfordshire had a completely different kind of natural elevation so far as trees were concerned. And this is it. Uh, great elms standing above the manor. You can, see, you can see the manor through the trees there on the left. Uh, and the countryside is actually more open in some ways than it is today. Of course, this was taken in October, I think. But uh, you can see how tall the elms were in relation to the manor in those days. The plan does make recommendations for the protection and enhancement of Kelmscott flora and fauna. Um, and it has been pointed out to me recently, actually, that Morris had a particular interest in birds. And even if the elms have gone, I suppose it's a tribute to nature's persistence that the dominant sound at Kelmscott on a summer day today is still provided by the descendants of Morris's Parliament of Rooks. But perhaps uh, the most uh, pressing concern of the moment is how best to care for the very good collection of vernacular farm buildings that are such a quintessential element of the Kelmscott estate. This is the paddock barn, the interior of the paddock barn, right behind the manor house on the west side. This is the sort of structure that Morris esteemed great here and it now badly needs full conservation repairs. It houses the garden store at one end but is otherwise unused. And there are other agricultural buildings at Kelmscott, some in full use, some not at all in need of maintenance. I think we need to make sure that we're using the buildings of the farmyard particularly effectively to any new proposals are thoroughly sympathetic to their vernacular architectural character. The barn that houses the tea room is unsuitable in cold weather, and it seats just over 30 people comfortably. The average coach party, I think, is well over 50. <coughs> in the summer, it's possible to sit at tables outside, and if it's raining, there's a plastic tent that often provides warmer, a warmer accommodation than the tea room itself. There it is, the glorious plastic tent. And this is what happened when people visit the property. <coughs> well, I think <coughs> it might be possible to get more seating into the tea room barn if we could somehow get the toilets, and even possibly the kitchen, out of it. They occupy very good spaces, 
uh, that would make seating areas uh, quite capacious ones. Uh, and I just want to show you a couple of those areas. That's the kitchen roof, a very splendid room, uh, the kitchen, beautiful, uh, probably the best roof in the building. And then we have these compartmented areas at either end of the barn, stables at one end which house the gents lose, and the ladies uh, under this section of roof at the, at the southern end. It's rather a waste of, uh, of good space to divide it up in this way, and, uh, and I, I imply no criticism of uh, the fact that we did it, because I'm sure we did the right thing. Uh, at, at the time. But how would we get rid of them? Well, it's conceivable that, uh, you know, the history of the property provides some hints. Uh, not that something that ever concerned William Morris, but uh, here is uh, E.H. News' bird's eye view uh, of the property in about 1890. And we can see just down here, this is the, the barn I've just been talking about, the tea room barn is here. And we can see at right angles to it, just here, a thatched fire, a big long thatched fire. It runs at right angles to the tea room barn. The reconstruction of the reconstruction of this feature or a version of it uh, might accommodate some of the uses of taking up space in the tea room barn and would restore to the farmyard one of the thatched roofs whose gradual loss throughout the area in the 1890s was a matter of great concern to Morris. There are no thatched roofs in Count Scott House. We might be able to put one back, obviously, we'll need external funding, that goes without saying. But it's a kind, it, it, it's a tactic, it's a possibility, it's something that we could do. News uh, prospect also shows the great South Road barn. This is a magnificent and almost untouched 17th century agricultural building. The domestic end, which is just uh, down here, is, um, is used for storage. And the main volume at the north end, uh, it currently accommodates a, an aging but good exhibition and is also used for the reception of school parties. Nestling in its shadow, however, on the west side, we find a rather unprepossessing garden shed and a pop-up gazebo, which are the first point of contact for visitors wanting a ticket and information. These functions could very easily be housed in this underused barn, and in such a way that some of its existing uses in its grand interior would emerge unscathed. Well, I'm coming towards the end of my uh, remarks now, and I've so far veered away from repeating anything I said uh, at the tape reception the other night, but I can't resist it to end up. The very things that attracted Morris, Morris to Kelmscott are the qualities that are most easily damaged by institutional ownership, and they are peace, remoteness, authenticity, individuality, and romance. We all agree that Kelmscott must be preserved, that will not be achieved by keeping things exactly as they are. There must be an element of change if this is to remain the setting for the epoch of rest that is the subtitle of news from nowhere. Visitor numbers are increasing and carrying on with the same opening regime could very easily damage the manner and the experience of visiting it. It's also clear that a no holds barred policy to commercial lettings and other profitable sidelines could not be accommodated in the manor and its village without great difficulty. The purpose of the conservation management plan is to ensure that Kelmscott changes gradually without damaging the things for which we value it so highly. So to quote, as I did the other night, Lampedusa's The Leopard, everything has to change so that everything can remain the same. Thank you. I'm going to give the background to the tester bed. The bed has a long history, and like the table and the chair, it satisfies one of the most fundamental of man's furnishing needs. From the earliest times, great attention has been bestowed upon four-poster beds. Our ancestors spending more money on their construction than on any other piece of furniture. The only bed consisted of little more than a wooden frame, the mattress supported on wooden boards or on ropes fixed to the frame. In the 12th century, there were neither posts, cornices, nor high wooden backs to the beds, and it was not until the close to the Middle Ages that these evolved. 
Later in the 13th century, a canopy or tester was introduced, suspended from the ceiling or from beams by cords on which the curtains were hung. And uh, you can see on this image uh, a, a bed with a, a, a canopy. With the development of the bed came structural changes. By the 15th century, four posts were used to hold the tester in place, from which were hung rails for curtains and necessity to keep out the drafts. The woodwork was of minor importance and value in comparison to the hangings. In all large houses, births, marriages, and deaths, and the reception of distinguished guests were great events in which the bed played a part. Minute descriptions are found in early inventories when those of other furniture are meager. And here you can see an image of an early bed with, with the uh, rails, the curtain rails supported from the ceiling. So this is an early part of the evolution of the tester bed. In wills dating from the 14th century onwards, the best, inverted commas, poster beds, were regarded as family possessions of the highest consequence. But it, is, it was not of the wooden construction that was thought to be of value, but the draperies on which time and labor had been lavished so freely. They are often described as being of rich imported cloth. Romantics recorded the extraordinary splendor of hangings that were found on beds where they were embroidered, embroidered velvets and threads, and uh, tapestries were embroidered with naturalistic scenes that were applied to the textile. By the 16th century, a richly carved and paneled headboard was attached to the bed frame, and a wooden canopy extended from the top of this to the front of the massive carved posts actually standing away from the bed. This image shows a, a bed with the posts that are not attached to the bed frame. And you can see how uh, an evolution and progression from the earlier beds. In the late 16th century, we saw Mitzi more extravagant care indulged upon the posts, headboards and cornices. This manifested in rich ornamentation overloaded with grotesques, carvings, monsters, cupids, griffins, all found on headboard posts, and cumbersome turnings of up to 18 inches in diameter on the foot posts, which we can see here. Within the headboard, exotic timbers were often employed and then laid in various forms. And until the mid-18th century, the bedroom was the place where visitors were received and births attended as spectacles. In fact, a private reception room it was more than a piece of furniture, becoming virtually a room within a room. Therefore, the bed was the center of attention, and hangings varied according to wealth, plain or ornate, and valued, and frequently recorded in wills, which we have said. So on the image uh, on the left, you, you can see the arcaded inlay. And on the right, you can see various grotesques and uh, different carvings. Now moving on to the Morris bed. So the, we've just had a little bit of background of how the bed evolved. Uh, With any historical material, you have to balance the risks against visitor exposure, namely how many people will have the opportunity to view the object. And this is obviously one of the challenges and one of the uh, things that were brought up by the society when they were asked to borrow the bed. Uh, there are many stresses that are incurred by dismantling, handling, and reassembly. And by undoing uh, bolts, you release the tension. And when the object is put together again, you obviously have to tension it up again. Once the decision to go ahead 
for the for an object or this bed had been agreed, all other risks had to be considered and based on the recommendation of a conservator. And as we see in the Morris bed, it is the hangings that generally receive the attention. But we're going to strip the bed of the valance, curtains and counterpane to gain an understanding of the bed and its construction. Once the textiles are removed, we can start to see how a bed is, is formed. And you can also see its proportions. The image on the left uh, shows uh, a mattress which is probably 1970s divan. And it gives actually the wrong profile to the bed when the bed is made. The image on the right, you can see the bed without the mattress. And at some stage, there's the green, which is on the side rails, is a canvas that has been put on for some reason that I'm not quite sure about. The construction of these beds has changed little over the centuries, and oak continued to be the dominant timber. The first step in dismantling these beds is to remove the tester or canopy. The tester is a framework of oak enriched with carvings and generally accommodating panelling. From this hung the curtains, which were a method of eliminating drafts that haunted the, uh, generally haunted the English house. The tester is generally held in place by vertical rods inserted into the top front, into the top front post there, and in the back. And I'm surveying the, the bed before we lift the test off to see exactly how it is put together. This method of, hold, of supporting a tester is commonly found on beds from the 15th, 14th, 15th centuries right through to the 19th centuries. Uh, there was no change in the construction there. Once this had been undertaken, the tester could be examined. Once this had been undertaken, the tester could be examined. As you can see, it is a fairly simple construction of framework and panels. A feature commonly employed in 16th and 17th century room interiors found on box pews, chests, and paneling. A peg mortise and tenon joint was originally employed to join the verticals to the horizontal styles. Architectural paneling from interiors can be found re-employed within some of these testers and old beds. But uh, I'm quite sure that, uh, quite confident, this Morris bed is not recycled material for the tester. The image on the right shows the underside of the, the tester. As the bed had been standing in Kelmscott for many years and had now been dis was now being dismantled, it was a good opportunity to vacuum the tester top because in uh, situ it wasn't possible to get to the, the top of the bed, I think. The close image shows details of old woodworm infestation where the insects have been att attracted to the proteins in the hide glue and animal glue. As you can see, it's very localized. And the, uh, none of the woodworm is active, I'm uh, pleased to say. Uh, for everyone's sort of information, woodworm has a seven-year life cycle, and it survives in a humidity of more than 70%. But they can lay dormant for six and a half years and then be activated. Here we see the uh, construction of the cornices. Details of the top cornice reveal a very basic construction that was unchanged over five centuries. Generally, these are hugely unstable 
and over the t over time have had to be strengthened. And you, on the image on the right, you can see battening, and this batten here is to strengthen up or to tighten up the uh, cornice. And then the additional glue blocks have been added there as, as supports as well. But that is very common with the with a, a bed of that age. Looking at the front post from the bed, we see the more restrained and bulbous form of a reproduced 17th century cup and cover. This turning, frequently carved with acanthus and gadroon covers and turning, a progression from the exaggerated earlier Elizabethan cup and cover that we see on the right, surviving uh, on the bed on the right. A feature also found on tables, cork cupboards, and furniture prior to uh, the Jacobean period. It's interesting to see that the classic Greek design features employed such as acanthus and iconic capitals. The reeded and scallop carving on the Morris bed cups greatly contrasts with the tightly controlled and regimented medallions Banding the waist and the inverted acanthus on the cup, and as we have seen, an evolution from the early, earlier exaggerated bulbous cup. So this is a very restrained turn. It's interesting to observe the construction, where the timber blocks have been built up to accommodate the required dimensions. And on this image here, you can see that there's five pieces of timber have been required to make this. So there's the central turning, and then it's been built up on the four sides. For, the, for this, there's two reasons. One is economy of timber, and the other is also to reduce shrinkage and splitting, which occurs when, the timber of la when large bolts of timber dry out. I've recently seen a reproduced... Uh, cup and cover of the first image that we saw. And this was uh, produced about three years ago, and now it is split, because that is only one piece of timber. So it's uh, not beneficial. Now the front cups are removed, we can concentrate on the bed headboard. A board housed under the tester and located between the back posts displays a richly carved, high-relief early English panel depicting a mythical beast. As the back posts are not embellished, this detailed board adds, inter adds interest to what appears to be later panelling. On the image on the right, you can see Julia Collections Managers, who I'm sure a lot of you know here at the Society. Uh, discussing the panel with Kathy Haslam, who's the visitor experience uh, manager at Kelmscott. And they were greatly interested to have a detailed look at it. To continue the dismantling, the headboard was supported by technicians. And here you can see the uh, carved panel came from above where that, uh, the technician is his right hand. And that's where that board lived. The uh, bolts were used to hold the bed, the back of the bed head, to the side rails. And bolts have been used for centuries. And this allowed for fairly easy dismantling of beds as they were moved generally and often moved from house to house. Interesting, the head, interestingly, the headboard is constructed from some earlier 18th century elements, which are clearly discernible. But the general framing and arcading appears to be 19th century. Uh, this is obviously an add-on here. And we'll see some detailed shots in a minute, but they're from down there where it's been rebuilt, and the whole back rail is rebuilt. And there's insertions on the panels here and here, which we'll see. Uh, in some images in a moment. 
in most panel in most panel backs headboards, the arcading starts from a ledge or shelf rail. On these, rush lights were placed. Okay. There's the shelf rail, and these rails were used to uh, to support lights. And this was obviously a great hazard and caused great many fires in houses and bedrooms. The noteworthy Moresque or interlaced design inserted into the arcading can possibly date to the late 16th or 17th centuries. Intarsia inlay in arcading is a notable feature from the early 16th and 17th century beds, generally coarse in execution with bog oak, box, and holly inlays. Uh, so these panels, I think, are earlier panels that have been inserted into this. Bed. These shots uh, show the details of the back post and of the, of the bed head, and they've been modified to accommodate what are clearly historic side rails. So the rail that we're looking at down here is old material and this join here, this bed has been built up so this is new material down here. This is older material but it's not the same age, that's not as historic as that material so we have a complete uh, build up to construct the bed as we see it today. The sides and end rails of the oak frame, framed okay, uh, four poster bed where the rail is grooved and the ropes are drawn through them to support the mattress. So here you can see holes here and the mattress, uh, the, these rails have been recycled from another bed and they would have had lashings to support the mattress, uh, the mattress of, of uh, plaited rushes. The side rails from the Morris bed have rope lashing holes commonly found on early beds. But as we can see on the back rail, other than this having old woodworm infestation, you can see lots of old woodworm infestation. And this is a recycled piece of timber. There's no uh, continuity of the uh, infestation into the timber, the adjacent timber. This confirms that this bed has never had rope lashing because there's no holes in the, on the back uh, rail. And uh, one would generally expect it to have holes there to support what would be three mattresses that are found on 16th, 17th, 18th century and even 19th century beds. This image demonstrates how it would look if it was if it did have holes and the, and the mattress could be supported on lashing and the bedding would have consisted of a straw wall pallet on top of the uh, rush mat in eighteen sixty eight that was the year that Morris concluded the study of Islamic culture and three years later traveled to Iceland the same year as taking on the uh, Kelmscott tenancy, he was greatly inspired by the Norse legends. And this may well connect with the bed's footboard, possibly reflecting ancient folklore. And here we see on the right a selection of uh, Norwegian and Icelandic objects that would have been available for Morris to see at the time to get his inspiration. And the fet, the, uh, on, on the left here, we see the, the board with the uh, engraving into it. The decorative board itself appeared to have been cut down as the design would have extended beyond that scene on the bedpost. So on here, this is definitely sawn away. The original, the car panel extends there to there. This rail, this uh, rail at the top, uh, at the bottom and the top, 
uh, additions. And the board has also been laminated or, or glued onto another board, which forms the tenon. So this board also has come from something else. Also, the timber differs from the rest of the bed. And you can see how it has been built up. And finally, we dismantle the front posts. The square front posts are certainly historic timber work and date perhaps to the 17th century. They have been cut down to incorporate the term cup and cover that we see here. Generally, these posts would terminate on the floor, but in this instant, the posts terminate at the front uh, and side rail level. <laughs> Resting on a square plinth, and the square plinth is very obviously an addition. The modified bun feet are a 19th century indulgence and they're a slightly odd feature uh, to the bed. I'm unaware of the origins of them and I've never seen any bed with anything quite like these really. Uh, you can see here this has very obviously been sawn off here and so, yeah, it's sawn there. So you can see it's the post here has, has been cut down. The logistics of moving large furniture from a d domestic environment can be a great challenge and the undertaking the removal of the tester and headboard within Kelmscott did pro uh, prove a great challenge. The stairways and banisters being a huge problem. The technicians were fantastic and the problem was there, you can see down here, there's a doorway. And one had to lift the tester and also the backboard over the new post and somehow get it down and safely, it was, it was achieved safely. The image on the right shows the components as we took them or dismantled them, they were being packed. So the, these are all the different parts of the bed being packed up. And itself, you would normally think uh, you have a removal van and you put the put your furniture in it. But these are art objects, so they're handled by art handlers, and everything is treasured. The image on the left shows some of the objects in the truck, so you can see how well they were packed. And on the left, the any large components are strapped to the sides of the truck and they're on their way to the Tate. And uh, the truck is loaded, and it was a momentous day for the society, I think, to loan such an iconic object of theirs. In conclusion, when considering the course of the development of English furniture, we have seen little change in the tester over four centuries, no significant changes in construction, and little stylistic deviation. But, from t from, but over time, this particular bed came to represent the furnishings of a broad spectrum of society from cottage to the fine house. Reflecting on this, the bed we have been looking at has definitely been assembled from various components. It is not trying to pass as a 17th century bed, but more in the style of that era. We have seen carved elements from objects incorporated into the 19th century joinery. The footboard is possibly a Morris addition, as is the carved panel on the headboard. But by adding these elements, the bed has been personalized, perhaps, by Morris. But I'm sure Morris did not commission this bed. The general joinery is not up to arts and crafts standard, and I'm sure he would not wish this to be thought so. I hope you have gained some appreciation of the bed and that you will now look at beds beyond the hangings. Thank you very much to...